consistency, if you're consistent, is because you're disciplined, right? People start eating random shit and junk food when you haven't eaten it for 12 weeks and they wonder why like they've got stomach issues and they yes. can't go to the toilet or they get the shits exactly. or whatever. They're getting like, the shits, they're on stage sweating like yeah. crazy. Looking back at your career, if you look back in hindsight, would you give yourself any different advice knowing what you know now versus back then when you started? Yeah, so I didn't look at it like the odds were against me, like a light-skinned guy with braids, right? It, it made me stand out. I won the Olympia, it's crazy, right? So, and that's another thing I would always encourage all races to, to compete and, and. Welcome to another episode of The Shred Show. Today is sick because I've got a really good friend of mine, Mark Anthony, who is the first men's Mr. Olympia men's physique. I've had the pleasure of training a couple of times and getting taught a few lessons in training out here in Vegas. Um, built up a really good friendship. He's also got a really ostentatious and flamboyant dress sense in this <laughs> myself. Uh, so we have a lot of conversations like that. And he recently taught me buying to another, buying another watch. So um, thank you very much for your time today, Mark. Absolutely. Thank, thanks for having me on. First thing I wanted to ask you, which I think is very relevant, that covers everything fitness related and also business related is, with obviously competing at the level you have done and also having a partner compete at the level that she does, um, because your partner's obviously won Bikini Miss Olympia before. What do you think is the key to like staying calm under pressure? Individually or as like a Both. team? Both. So pressure is something that I found that I thrive on. Um, I feel like personally when I was feeling I would put pressure on myself. I never really allowed anyone to put pressure on me, but I felt like when I put pressure on myself is when I really thr thrived and excelled. Um, now, within my relationship with my wife, um, me being out of the game when it comes to competition now, and she is extremely relevant and at the top of her game, I try not to put pressure on her. She's a much different individual than I am, right? She's just so um, regimented and prepared and... Um, her mind is always in a really good place. So I'm more, uh, the, I put the pressure on myself when it comes to her prep because I coach her. But um, overall, like the dynamic between us is always very smooth. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when you were competing back in the day, though, did you feel pressure then in that? Did you find ways to keep yourself calm in that situation? Yeah. So the, actually, there, there were instances of me feeling pressure or. Um, I didn't. I felt more like there was a responsibility that I had as a, a world champion, as an Olympia champion, and it's just my character to want to lead by example. Um, at the time, men's physique was men's physique was a new division ten years ago, right? And um, when I became the champion, I, I said to myself that I wanted to really um, show and prove to the world, especially a world of full of filled with men who are bodybuilders, that this was also bodybuilding, not just you know, some pretty boys in shorts that coming and doing an ab show. I wanted them to know that we train, we train legs. I mean, at the time, you know, it's, it's, it's evolved a lot now, but the pressure I had was always just to be, you know, the perfect um, example. And of course, there's no such thing as perfect, but to me, I felt like I had to be perfect all the time for myself and to lead by example for the guys coming up. Um, so yeah, there was a little bit of pressure on winning all the time, but you know, what, what's winning, right? It's not necessarily winning first place on stage, but winning every day in life. And that, that to me, I really had to grow into that because my identity became being Mr. Olympia and, uh, Jennifer on the contrary, that's not her identity. She doesn't identify with being Miss Olympia. She, she's educated and, um, you know, she went to she graduated university with honors and stuff like that. My path was a little bit different. So this was like the biggest highlight of my life. But as I, I grew out of it, you know, things changed as I got into business and these type of things. But did you find that difficult the year after you won and then you didn't win if like that oh, yeah. transition must have been fucking hard? Oh yeah, because coming up as an amateur, I was like, there was a lot of hype around me. And like I had discussed with you earlier, you know, Jay Cutler was my guy, you know, he was the one that came out and was like, yeah, this is my guy, you know, like, he's going to be the best. George Farrow was my coach and he was like, this is going to be, this guy's going to be the best. And with, with those type of people, you know, vouching for me, that's where I felt like some pressure stemmed as well, you know? Because you have to prove points to them, right? Exactly. I had to prove to them that, that, you know, their investment in me and their, their, uh, their care and their love that I was going to exceed and, and really make them proud. So, um, 
transitioning from being, you know, the golden child and then turning pro. When I would turn pro, man, it was crazy. It was at the North Americans. It was 2011. I was walking backstage with George Farrell, my coach, and my parents. And people were, you know, in the back preparing, getting ready to go on stage. We were not on stage for another, like, three hours. And everyone was congratulating me already. Like, congrats, man. I'm like, what's going on here? I, we haven't even gone on stage. We haven't competed against each other yet. Why are people congratulating me? But there was such a buildup and such a hype because of this new division that was so appealing to, to men that didn't think they had the genetics to be a bodybuilder, but loved bodybuilding. And at the time, classic physique wasn't available. So this was the, the thing, you know? Um, but winning three pro shows in a row after I turned pro, the LA, LA Grand Prix, the Orlando um, Europa Super Show, and then the New York Pro, back to back. Going into 2013 is when they, they started the Olympia. That's when I won. And then 2014 it was when I was defeated by Jeremy Buendia, who went on to win four times. So yeah, it was, it was definitely challenging because it was so much like, you know, moving up and, and developing this division in its infancy stages that I felt like I was really part of that, pioneering it. And then to go from winning everything and being the guy to placing six was, was definitely rough. But, you know, it, it, it taught me how to, you know, have some thick skin and that's just part of the game, right? And being gracious in defeat, right, yeah, as well. It's exactly. like an important thing. Yeah. Um, because you can't always win everything. You can't, you can't always win everything. Yeah, and but I think life's like that, right? Yeah, you have, to, you can have things you're going to lose, and you have to learn to deal with it. That's right. It's just the way it is. So, and especially in a sport like ours, where it's um, subjective, right? You're in front of a judging panel, and they're saying who looks better than who that day. But uh, Jeremy won, and he deserved to win. Um, I have no regret. At the time, of course, you're upset, you're a little bit disappointed, but I knew that I was going on, going to go on and do other things and to have triumph in my life. You mentioned Jay Cutler's influence. How much did he influence you earlier on in your career? Man, he... Uh, none of this would have ever happened for me. Um, of course, I, I was the one that did the work, but he, he is my ultimate inspiration. He, he took me under his wing. He was my friend. And that's what I love the most about him, is that he's my friend. He was not like saying, you know, do this this way, do this that way. You know, we, our relationship wasn't built on bodybuilding. It was built on, you know, things that we enjoyed. Like we love cars, money. At the time, we were both single, so chicks. You know what I mean? um, and of course, we would talk, you know, about bodybuilding. But he was just a big brother, and um, he really made me. I moved to Vegas, and Vegas, as you know, is it's it's a great city, but you can get caught up real easily here in the nightlife and the pool parties and these type of things. And knowing that I had to be accountable to someone who cared about me, invested in me, I, I just wouldn't mess up. So people was like, how did you go to Vegas and, and do so well? Because there's other people that would come here and they would, these guys were like talented bodybuilders would just get chewed up because they got into the nightlife or partying and it's a slippery slope. But I was so focused because I respected him so much and I wanted to show him that you know, I, I am who I said I was, you know, but he was, he was and still today one of my, the ultimate inspiration, like, uh, I pay attention to everything he says and what he does very, very carefully, more than, than anybody, except for my wife. Did you find it, you mentioned George Farrell was coaching as well, do you find it difficult sometimes if you had different opinions, say if Jay Cutler was saying one thing to you and George was saying something different? Because that's obviously like a thing that happens a lot when people are in preps and coaches. Yeah. Like one person says something, one person says something else, and you're a bit like... Right. So fortunately, you know, Jay was always the one that would say, just listen to what George tells you to do and follow what he tells you. You know, that's what he's, he does. This is what he does. He's the best at that. So fortunately, we never had any kind of, um, you know, crossfire there. So it was really like... I look, now that we're talking about it, I have to think back and be like, man, I was really blessed to be in the presence of this these two individuals that, you know, believed in me, you know? So it was, it was very smooth with both of them. Do you think men's physique has gotten too far now in terms of the development of where guys are at you know, you versus where they were? Like, I know we spoke a bit about this the other day. Yeah, but we spoke about this yesterday. Um, 
Here's the thing. I love bodybuilding, okay? My dream as a kid was to be a bodybuilder. Um, and my life took this path and it, it, it ended up in men's physique, which I'm very proud of. But just like anything in life, any sport, any division, it's going to evolve. Sometimes it evolves for the worse or the better. I feel like it got a little bit uncontrollable when the guys were in men's physique were actually bigger than the guys in classic physique. Okay, Because there's no weight cap at the time. No weight cap at the time, which you now have implemented a weight and height cap, just like the amateur division in the pro division, which I think is going to be um, better to give athletes a fair shot that have different structures. And I have to give it to some of the smaller guys, let's say like the smaller structured guys. They've been holding their own. Um, for example, Aaron Banks is the current Mr. Olympia, and he's about 6'1", if not taller, if I'm not mistaken. And Diogo from Brazil is about 5'7", or 5'8", and he plays third or fourth. I can't remember. I believe he was third. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive, you know, for a guy who's 5'7", compete against a guy who's 6'2", six, six and still be, you know, Competing, Hanging, battling, yeah. yeah, battling against each other essentially. So, um, I feel like this will will create a little bit more control. Um, the guys tend to sometimes look a little bit too muscular. Um, for me, Ryan Terry has one of the prettiest physiques. Uh, I feel like that's what men's physique really is. Same thing with Jeremy. Um, really love his physique. Uh, and Brandon, Brandon's a you know he he's. He's kind of freaky, right? He's a little bit more freaky because he's so round and so like dynamic to look at, you know. But uh, I feel like sometimes you'll see some guys. It's gotten better the past couple of years, actually. But there was a point there two years ago where guys were coming in really jacked, shredded, dry, striated, and it was kind of like, well, you know, now there's classic physique, like. You know what I mean? The guys in men's physique are bigger than the guys in classic physique, yeah. right? They, some guys in the pro guys in men's physique would not be able to compete in classic physique because they wouldn't make weight. Mm. But I've seen the same thing with friends of mine in, in amateur who've gone from open, yeah. size down a bit, and then gone into men's physique, physique because yeah. they couldn't make, they weren't, couldn't get the size to go fully open. They're too big for classics right. to go into men's physique, which doesn't make any sense, right? right? Exactly. So I guess, you know, it's just, you know, you put these things into play and the divisions will kind of fall into where they need to be. And I'm happy, really happy, you know, Tyler Mannion, the vice president of the IFBB Pro League and the NPC, um, obviously the grandson of Mr. Jim Mannion, who is the president, two gentlemen that I have tremendous respect and love for. Um, Tyler has been, you know, he's, he's younger, so he's implementing some great systems and procedures. Um, not that anything was wrong before, but, you know, like these things like the weight caps and the, the, the height, um, he's implementing these systems where it's going to be, I think, a little bit more organized. Yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, you've been very successful as an athlete, which is obviously undisputable. You're also very successful as a coach. What would you say your optimal peak week strategies look like with clients? Um, for, for a client in yeah. peak week? So optimal peak weeks, I feel like this is where people... Can I curse on here? Yeah, you say whatever. <laughs> it's why I like podcasts. You say whatever for a few months. Yeah. Uh, it's free speech. Yeah, I feel like this is where people really fuck things up because... The term peak week is a fairly new term, right? I'm 40, I'm going to be 44 in November, so I, I consider myself... But it doesn't look it. Old school, yeah. <laughs> um, I went to the barber and I got my gray hairs... Uh, I'm asking for his skin routine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, people will prepare with certain types of food groups. Um, they will play with their caloric intakes and their macros. Their digestion is working well. They're getting in shape. They're looking sharp. And then peak week comes around. Then they want to deplete and load and use potatoes and sweet potatoes and gummy bears and all these type of things and just derail their digestion and wonder why they're either holding water or looking soft or their, their stomach is bloated. Um, optimal for me is really paying attention to my client's digestion. What types of quantities of certain food groups are making them hold water or look drier and knowing the difference between body fat and water um, what types of carbohydrates are most efficient for them to get 
fuller in the tissue with glycogen. So we keep, I personally keep all the food groups that have been, ha we've been having success with, and I just really play with the portion sizes of it. Does that make sense? hundred percent. And yeah. for me, it's for, so like logically fucking retarded where people start eating random shit and junk food when you haven't eaten it for 12 weeks and they wonder why like they've got stomach issues and they yes. can't go to the toilet or they get the shits exactly. or whatever. They get like, the shits, they're on stage sweating like yeah. crazy, right? Um, so like for me, for example, I remember when I competed last year that I was just ending up carving up on like cream of rice and yep. rice cakes and mm -hmm. just as much of that same shit that I was Clean. eating before, but just more of it, right? Right. And then you know you're not going to have an issue in terms of like having a weird reaction to anything that's going to throw you. Your body's familiar with it already. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure you've done tests along the way where you increase your carbs to 500 one day when you were doing 100. So the body is accustomed to this. It's familiar with what's happening. And I have clients that go backstage and they're like in another city and they're like, coach, you know, all these people are eating like chocolates and stuff. I'm like, don't fucking pay attention to that. Just, don't watch it. Just look at what you have to yeah, do yeah. and that's it. You know, it's, you know I, I, give, I give you the layout, eat at this time, eat this at this time, you know, send me a, a check in right after. So. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people, um, or I'll have inquiries and people are like, well, what does your peak week look like? This question you just asked yeah. me, and I'm like, listen. But why would you even fucking ask anyone that when you're not even in shape yet? There you go. It depends, right? You're not even in shape. We haven't done a prep yet. I don't know how your, your body, um, you know, digests or absorbs nutrients. So, yeah, it's just a lot of social media lingo, let's say. Hype. Hype, yeah. Peak week. What are we doing for peak week? Or even like, you know, with drugs and gear, people are like, I, I do inquiries um, with guys who are super young and they're like, all right, well, I'm, I, need, I need to take this and this and this. And I'm like, listen, man, I'm not the right coach for you then because you don't need to take any of this, you know? So it's, it's just, I believe, the, the way the culture has become and a lot of information online that most of it is garbage. You know what I mean? When it comes to like the bro science stuff. Do you think that's gotten worse? Because even like... I remember back in the day, like, show my age now, that you didn't have social media, so it was like bodybuilding.com forums, and like, I think it was one in the UK, it was called like Muscle Talk and shit yeah. like that, so you'd go like looking for information. And that was it. Yeah. Right? And was, magazines. Yeah, and magazines. Like, I would wait for the magazines to come out. My mother still to this day has them in her basement, boxes of them. I would read them every month. I would get a flex, muscle, muscular development, and a muscle and fitness. And an Inside Fitness magazine, which is a Canadian publication. There's something quite cool about that, though, right? I loved it because you, you, you had something to look forward to. And the time I was young, so I would save, you know, like 30 bucks to buy four magazines. And um, I would read them front to back, back to front. And I would see Jay Cutler's workouts. I would, you know what I mean? And I would just copy it, you know? So uh, that was my source of information at the time. And like, as that kind of um, evolved, it was like you said, forums or web pages you'd go on there bodybuilding.com and you would see people's testimonials and what the pros were doing and stuff like that and then social media just kind of took over right do you think much has really changed in the last 10 years and say from when you were at your peak until now in terms of the strategies people use say for building muscle getting shape for shows or it's just people trying to reinvent the wheel a little bit yeah it's just people using fancy words um, and yeah, just a lot of fancy words when really all you need to do is the basic scientific things that that really work, you know. Um, there are some coaches. So what I did as I transitioned from the competition stage is I hired all the best coaches in the world, okay? Um, from George Farah to Patrick Tour to um, Milos Sharchev, Matt Jansen, uh, Dorian Hamilton, Dean St. Mart. And what I, what I did was I was paying attention to all of the things that potentially made them successful. Their systems and procedures or just their educational knowledge, experience, how they apply certain things, nutrition, drugs. And the common thing that was successful in all of them were the things that were super basic. Georgian... Patrick, George Fair and Patrick Tour were the most basic, and with those two guys is when I looked the best. In terms of the most basic, what do you mean by that? The intricacies were not too crazy. Like with Milos, it was a lot of stuff. Yeah, like, I've, I've, I know Milos, and I've done, he's on the podcast twice. I've done a couple of seminars with him yeah. before and trained with him, and it's yeah. like 
is anally detail of like how many different things and yes. like for me I'd forget to do some of that because it's too complex I've got too many things going on and that's exactly and what I happened. can't train like for Sabres training I can't train twice a day and like it's impossible it's impossible and this is the, these are the things that I ran into with him however he's brilliant mm. okay he's brilliant and everything that he he um, he says like you know with your your pre your pre workout intro workout post workout and the insulin and these type of things it really makes sense and I've applied it and it does work however from my lifestyle I don't I didn't have a lifestyle where I can just sleep, eat, and train. You know, I had to work to provide for my family, right? So, and it's not what I wanted to do anyways anymore. You know, I was kind of like exiting the competition realm. And, um, but I'm happy that I, I did hire him as a coach because I learned a lot. So, um, to answer your question, I feel like what I learned from all of these people was just to stick to the, the meat and potatoes, right? And this really pay attention to my clients and what they their, their needs and wants were. It's interesting you say that because I think the older I've gotten, the more I've realized it's like all that really matters and is consistency. Consistency. Like you don't have to be perfect. It's like 80% consistency, yes. Con yes. like consistently. Yes. And you will get there. That's it. That's what it comes down to. Discipline, well, consistency and consistency, if you're consistent, is because you're disciplined, mm. right? Um, just having the discipline and also the older I've gotten is when I was younger I was very neurotic and neurotic in the, in the sense that I wanted to do everything perfect like stress about small details yes, small, yeah. stress about small details and I was obsessive about bodybuilding and that's a feel that's why I was successful right anything that you want to be great at you have to be obsessed with in my opinion um, but what what I transitioned into was to having living in more optimism right so more optimis optimistic thoughts and encouraging thoughts actually made me better as opposed to like being so neurotic like I have to do this I have to do that I have to be perfect you know like sweating you know to I would sweat more with my thoughts than I was in the gym because I was so neurotic and the way I grew up um, I became an, an overachiever because um, I didn't grow up you know the most fortunate but I didn't care I just wanted to be the best at everything that I did right so as a kid I was always like, I have to be better. I have to be better. And I would never compare myself with other people. That's one thing my family always taught me was never to compare yourself to anyone that had success and don't want what they have, but pay attention and admire, you know, how they got there, right? So I was, I was an overachiever, which made me become neurotic. And as I got a little bit older, I, I, I transitioned and taught myself how to just really enjoy the moment, enjoy the pursuit of prep and you know, when you're doing cardio, double cardio, and you're in a caloric deficit, to enjoy that. And I'm happy I transitioned that way because now I don't do it anymore, but I remember those times, and it's an it's a, it's a enjoyable thought for me. So the good old days, right? Yeah, the good old days, yeah. <laughs> and I actually think about it even on a business perspective, when stuff was like shit, or you like, I remember I had like my, I used to have like a shitty little office shed. If anyone's watched a really old podcast, you will see that, mm. one video. Um, I used to have like a, like a shed in my garden that was like my office. Right. Like, I remember working out there at like 5 a.m. and it was like there's no heating and it's fucking cold. And I had a hoodie on it, but you could see your breath and stuff. Yeah. And you're like, this is savage, man. This is going to be a cool story right. one day. And you look back on things, you look at like, at the time it sucks, but you look back now with like fond memories and it's funny, right? Right. And I'm sure in your thoughts, you think back at that time. At the time it sucked, but you think back now and how simple was life then? Oh, it was easy. Right. So. Yeah, it's, it's those things that I really like want to reflect back on. And I love that you shared that with me because now that I've got to know you, I have a tremendous respect for you, of course, and um, the things that you do. And I'm always picking your brain and stuff like that, which I feel bad for. But um, I want to learn from the best. You know what I mean? I consider you one of the best at what you do. So, no, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, life is a funny thing when you look back. And a psychologist actually said this to me. Like, I'm, My girlfriend's probably listening to this, but I'm not very good at doing it. It's... When you're scaling the mountains, trying to look back and view, enjoy the view sometimes, and like, I think for anyone like in like a short finite career in terms of like sports, like yeah. competing, I think that's a really important thing to do. Like I think Chris Bumstead spoke about that a lot recently in terms okay. of like trying yeah. like like actually take in what's going on yep. rather than it just like fucking flash, flash by. Because yeah. I think we have like a we're so blinkered with things in life, like particularly very goal orientated yes. that you don't actually really see what's going on, and you're right. just like chasing, chasing, chasing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, it happens to the best of us, right? Um, but 
you know, just recently, as again, I'm saying this, I'm getting older, but just recently, I just thinking like how many friends of mine have passed away. And I was like, man, life is, is moving fast. Or I'll see some of my friends, one of my friends just, you know, got out of prison and I'm so happy to spend some time with him and work out with him and stuff like that. And I was talking, he has two daughters. His one daughter is going into high school. It's crazy. You know, this life just, life is just moving. So if you don't pay attention and like take it in, it's, before you know it, it's going to move without you. And you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it's, life's a good thing, man. Life's yeah. great. And it's why it's important to like seize the opportunity with everything. Yeah. Um, a question for you. What do you think differentiates the top five Olympians now versus everyone else? In which division? Any open, division. Let's say open men's bodybuilding. It's open. It's yeah. a good question, yeah. Okay, so the difference. Um, well, I might get chewed up for this because I'm not an open men's bodybuilding competitor and I never, I, I never competed as an open men's bodybuilder, as a professional. But from my observation, and as someone who really loves bodybuilding, um, and I've been in this game for a very long time, probably longer than most of the guys on stage right now, um, I'm fortunate to have become really good friends with a lot of guys who are my bodybuilding heroes. Jay, of course, Jay Cutler, um, Chris Cormier, who's a very dear friend of mine, we spent a lot of time together. Um, Dexter Jackson, Flex Wheeler. It's crazy because my dad was, would say, tell me, do you remember when you used to be obsessed with these guys and now you're, now they're texting you saying good luck before the Olympia, you know? You know, we can't wait to see you on stage or let's eat, have dinner after or something like that. Law of attraction. Yeah, law of, it's crazy. Like Chris, Chris Cormier and I will get together, we'll smoke a blunt, we'll get super high and we'll just, and stone and we'll just sit there and laugh and chat about everything else in the world now, you know? So those guys, they used to be a, a, a series of videos by a videographer at the time called Mitsuru. Uh, I forget how to pronounce his last name, but he's a Japanese guy and he used to come and do co a, a series called The Battle to the Olympia. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, I've heard it. Yeah. And I had all the VHS tapes, okay, that I, I used to order them and, and watch them over and over and over. And what he would do is go into their life and do a day in the life of what they're doing f for their prep. So, and you know, modern day bodybuilders are doing that as well. I just feel like the guys back in the day, you know, because you see on social media people saying like the guys were better back in the day and um, I just feel like they were a little more hardcore back in the day. You know, now guys are more concerned about how they look on camera and back then it was just like, I felt there was more camaraderie, you know. Uh, I'm also friends with Kevin Laroni today. I love that guy. He was one of my favorites as well. But seeing Kevin, Chris, Dexter, Flex, Jay, all those guys on the stage as a, as a teenager and as a, in my early 20s and then really admiring them and being like, wow, I still feel like that about them today. Today, the guys are not as... Iconic almost. No, they're not. There's not that... Um well, the, the allure is not the same, no. right? And although I have tremendous respect for all of them, you know, of course, Nick Walker and I are very close. Um, and, you know, all the guys in the top five or the top ten are extremely impressive. Maybe it's just I'm holding on to a memory, you know? Nostalgia. Yeah, maybe it's nostalgic to me. And um, I just feel like that lineup of bodybuilders, it'll be hard to really match or exceed that time so yeah i feel like um the difference is today it's more so socially driven back then it was more passion driven in my opinion i would agree and i think that probably shows in but you can even see it when you see people training right so yeah. like i've trained with dorian yates a few times mm -hmm. and and you look at someone like that in the 90s versus people today, or even like the way people train now, who even pros versus people. And we mentioned James Holland today, which we spoke about the other day. Oh, He's yeah. a friend of mine I've trained with a lot, lot of times. Like has that mentality of training like a fucking savage. So I've never trained with him, but from what I see, it, it reminds me a lot of the, the late 90s, yeah. right? And you've but, trained but, with him. Yeah, and it's just straightforward, but hard shit, right? It's no complicated stuff. No complicated stuff. 
no like all these angles and stuff like that. He's just getting in there, getting the job done, and um, p- putting in the grit, putting in the work, the hard work. Um, I've been fortunate to have dinner with him, and he's a lovely guy. And it, I just you know see him outside of the gym and then in the gym, it's just he's just a monster. He's a beast. So Dorian Yates, I, don't, I can't imagine what that was like to train with him. I know Chris Cormier used to train with him a lot, and he said it was insane. Um, I, I don't have a relationship with him or Ronnie Coleman, two of the greatest Mr. Olympias ever. But look, look at how they used to train. Look at look at what look at what the things that were important to them. You know what I mean? It's just different today. Interesting conversation with that though. Um, being your good friend with Jay Cutler, because I think there's a lot. It's like I think everything fucking works to some degree. Because if you look at say the way he, Jay Cutler trained. Mm-hmm higher volume never to complete failure yeah. never like just like heavy but not like retardedly heavy yeah. you look at the other two like Dorian and Dorian still was very good form but like Ronnie's like just fucking as heavy as you could yeah. very different situations but you look at if you look at Dorian and Ronnie respectfully not in greatest shape right. um, versus Jay now again we spoke we touched on that yesterday just in our conversations Jay is healthy mm. Jay you know I asked him the other day I said you don't have any joint issues? He's like, nothing. And I think it's because today people will tell you you have to train like this, so people want to train like that, right? Um, what Jay really was zoned in on is that he understood his body and the, me- the mechanisms, how it worked. So he trained how he felt like it was safe and optimal for him to grow. And I remember him saying to me that, you know, people always talk about his form and all these type of things. And he trained that way all his life, succeeded tremendously, and has no injuries today, right? So people will say he does partial reps or he, there's no contraction or, you know, lengthening the muscle, things that I practice today because, you know, I want to be safe. But he, I remember him telling me, yeah, all that science stuff is cool. But if you want to get fucking huge, you got to move fucking weight, right? So, I mean, he's he's shown and proved. So, what he says goes, man. It's uh, sometimes not what you know; it's what you can prove, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. I think it's a valid statement for a lot of things in life that gives context. Yeah. What would be looking back at your career if you looking back in hindsight? Would you give yourself any different advice knowing what you know now? versus back then when you started? Yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't really change anything because I'm very proud of how I did everything. But I I was never a lazy person. I always wanted to learn. And like, you know, even with our conversations about learning about business things and and online coaching and stuff, um, I just didn't have the knowledge on social media, right? So after I won, I felt like the younger guys that were coming up were more savvy with social media mm-hmm. and filming and YouTube and these type of things. And I slept on it, which was a huge error on my part. I should have, I should have focused more on that than my mentality was 2014, I'm coming to defend my title. I'm not showing anything. That was a mistake. All the other guys were showing everything. So what did that do? It drew an audience pay attention to them and now no one's paying attention to me when I'm the current champion so oh you're the current champion and you're not showing us anything then okay we're gonna pay attention to this guy and now they build some sort of relationship with these people and a fan now they become a fan so I essentially was losing people because I was hiding because I wanted to show this new physique Phil Heath was a bit like that right yeah yeah Phil Heath was a but it's different because Phil Heath had already the the superstardom you know this, that was men's open men's bodybuilding. This is men's physique. And it was still kind of like people were trying to figure out like, you know, who's, who's the best and who's doing what. And like, if I didn't draw the attention to myself and show what I was doing and these other guys were, I lost the audience. So I feel like that's the only thing that I would have paid more attention to is becoming more savvy with social media and how to, how to um, share more of what I was doing. Do you, so an interesting conversation from there, bear in mind your wife um, was Olympia bikini champion. Do you find a lot of the lessons you've learned, the life experience you have, you try and instill in oh, her now? Oh, for sure, 
for sure. For sure. And fortunately, well, she's a lot younger than I am. I'm 17 years her elder. And she is extremely savvy with all these type of things. Like, I'm still trying to figure out how to use my iPhone sometimes, you know? <laughs> Uh, and it's just because I need to put more effort into these type of things. But we bought like a professional camera, a Sony with, you know, all the bells and whistles. And she knows how to use it. Right. The same like our videographer is like, wow, I love that camera. You know, um, she knows how to use it. She'll film her own YouTube videos. And these are the things that I didn't know how to do. Right. And I should have just paid more attention to it. But yes, I do tell her. Like, I wish I would have done more of this and this and this. But she has a, a pretty good schedule and set up for herself where she, she doesn't miss a beat. So I'm, I'm, we are fortunate that she's very savvy with this type of things and she doesn't let things slip like I did. Do you think there's a big difference in terms of um, prepping bikini athletes versus like more male competitors? Absolutely. And what is the differences? Man, it's, 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 the bikini division is a very dynamic division. I'll tell you why. Because, and I've mentioned this in interviews before, because people will make fun of men's physique or bikini and say, oh, you don't train, you don't lift. I'll tell you something. My wife trains hard, and she lifts. Finding the amount of muscularity and condition to be right on the line and not too extreme, like she potentially was last year, Last year, she may have been too conditioned, but we wanted to show that not only can she be round and very angular, but she can also be conditioned. And it was something that people said, you know, we would like to see Jennifer Dory with a little bit more condition. And I think we pushed it a little too far. However, it's a physique that we're both proud of and she's very proud of that she was able to show and prove that she can be separated and she can be peeled. Now, she was too not people would say she was not conditioned enough before but she was winning like that right and that's where we needed me as a coach you need to really separate what bikini is and what bikini isn't right so this year you're going to see that kind of condition but with so much more roundness and volume because i'm not going to be as conservative as i was with like the food right so i was playing it safe to show to show a look that we that we were asked to bring and now I know what her best look is with the condition. So to answer your question is, it's very, very difficult to find that right, just enough condition, not too much, and just enough roundness and fullness and not too, not too much. So you really, really have to know the person's body and how it responds to food, nutrition, water, sodium. What do you think are some of the big mistakes people make with that? You mentioned about people's bodies responding to it. Because I think sometimes people are too aggressive with things and it, like, I don't think the body likes to be pushed too much right. one way. It tends to push back, right? Again, just like we were talking about with Peak Week, I feel like sometimes people, their, their, their thought process is right, but applying, like you said, too aggressive. Jen has salt in her pink Himalayan sea salt, organic pink Himalayan sea salt in her diet year round. The body's familiar with it. I know when she's drinking four to six liters of water, what she's going to look like, right? The mistake people make is that they try to like salt load, sodium load or sodium deplete and all these type of things. And it's unpredictable unless you've done tests throughout the season when the person's in shape, in shape meaning lean enough or dry enough or conditioned enough. Um, and Anything that's too excessive, especially with the body, like you said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a response. And nine times out of ten, it's not going to be the response you're looking for. So I like to do things very conservatively, and I feel like that's where we've had success. So I don't remove salt. I don't remove water. We just play with the quantities. I also think that if you're really conditioned and ready, you shouldn't really need to manipulate anything, right? Nothing. Leave, like, it, leave it like that. Muscle doesn't hold water, right? You've got no, no fat, then you're, yeah. you're lean enough. Right. And, and if the muscle tissue does have water in it, it's, it's not... People are like, I'm holding water. So they're, they're, they're mistaking subcutaneous water in the skin from water in the bellies, yeah, right? Interesting. Yeah. I, we want water in the bellies because it's going to look fuller and rounder, right? And that means she doesn't have to load as much with food to have 
intracellular water in her gut, right? Or, or digestion process. So, um, yeah, it's just, if you're in shape and, and you're getting better and sharper and sharper, stick with that plan. You know, you don't really need to deviate from it. 100%. Yeah. Do you think the drug usage has changed much over the last, like, 10 years from 2012 to 2022, 2023? I mean, fortunately for me, like, you saw when I won in 2013 where I looked natural, and then 2014, I was a lot harder. That's when I really introduced, but I was 34 years old. That's when I, you know, really introduced, you know, playing around with some PEDs under the guidance of... Um, a hormone doctor with a hormone um, therapy um, specialist, right? I was always conservative, so I know I can speak for myself. And the stories I hear from the guys in the, in the late 90s, that's super conservative compared to what it is today. Because some of the conversations that I have with people and what the guys are doing today, even in men's physique, just fucking blows my mind. I'm like, for one, where are you putting all this? And two, why do you look like shit? You know what I mean? Maybe you're getting terrible stuff or your body is telling you something. And, uh, yeah, I just feel like today it's just it's one of the, the topics that are in the forefront of the conversation. It's like, what am I taking or how much am I taking? That's like the first thing people want to know was the like, supplement first protocol, thing, first right? Thing. Rather than what's the training and nutrition. First thing. Which yeah. is like, that's like the icing on top of the cake yeah. rather than like the whole cake. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I get it, you know, I get it because that's what these young guys are growing up into now, this kind of culture, because that's what they see online. Right. And you have these guys like, I don't know who these guys are. Again, like the trend twins and the trend this and all these guys are like really promoting drug use when, you know, I'm having these consultations with these younger guys. If you notice, my roster is mostly women now. Because I can't deal with guys telling me like, and I, I love training men. I love co coaching men if they want to be coached. There's so many times I had to refund guys and say, listen, man, I don't think I'm the coach for you because you want to tell me what you want to do. Why do you hire me? You know? And then on the contrary, I have some guys that I had to like really change up their whole life when it comes to hormones and I have guys, one of my, a client of mine who's actually become a good friend of mine, he's like, thanks me because he's like, man, I'm healthy. You potentially saved their life. Yeah. He's like, the, what I was doing before was so reckless and I didn't, I realized it, but I didn't care because at the time I was just like, whatever it takes, you know? And now he's like, I'm natural. My testosterone levels and my free testosterone levels are optimal. They're back to where they should, should be. Another good friend of mine, he was playing professional, uh, at the time he was playing college hockey and he had he had torn his hip flexor he thought he would never play hockey again got the surgery got it repaired he started bodybuilding bodybuilding actually saved his life because it helped that injury he ruptured an achilles tendon now he's playing pro hockey again because i told him don't do bodybuilding man it's not for you you're 20 at the time he was 21 he came to me with taking a ton of gear and i said you know what would, would you be able to do hockey again? He was like, I would love to, but I don't know if I can. Anyways, long story short, he started pursuing hockey again. Now he's playing professional pot hockey. Uh, when I was coaching him, we got him up to like 300 pounds. Now he's like 225. He feels so much better. He's 25 years old now. He's young. He has great health. He has a good future ahead of him. And I'm not saying that bodybuilding is bad. I'm just saying today, the younger generation really depend and feel like drugs are you know, what they need, you know, mm -hmm. when it's not. Controversial question, but do you think too many th people think that bodybuilding is the answer in terms of them being successful with everything in life? Because one of the things I get frustrated with when I see people, particularly younger people in the fitness mm -hmm. industry, is like, yeah, fuck everything, fuck business, fuck anyone, fuck family, I'm just doing this thing, yeah. like, the rest can wait 15 years. I'm like, yeah. it's retarded. Man, and it's up to people like us to tell them. I have so many people telling me, like, that's it, man. I'm, I'm quitting my job. I'm not going back to university or college. I'm focusing on bodybuilding full time. And I want to tell him, like, I don't want to tell him. I actually do tell him. I said, that's a huge mistake. That's a huge mistake. And then I use myself as an example or use Jennifer as an example. Like, this is our hobby that has turned into a livelihood. But 
we still have a job or an education as well, right? Um, because you just, it's unpredictable. There's no guarantee. And again, there's no guarantee in anything in life, but uh, it's just not a clever move when it comes to thinking that you're just going to get sponsorships and live off those earnings because at any given time you could injure yourself, God forbid, and then your sponsors are like, oh, you're useless to us now, you know? So I really try to encourage younger people or people that are coming into the sport, doesn't matter how old they are, um, to do this because you love it. And to learn about nutrition, learn about training, exercise physiology and um, biomechanics and nutrition and um, learn about your body, you know, to be, op to be optimal, right? And carry these, these um, systems and procedures along the way so you can be a better person. Even if you don't want to compete anymore, like I still apply the things that I did with like eating every three hours, you know, doing a certain amount of cardio work, lifting like I love lifting we had a great arm workout yesterday my arms are super sore thank you by the way um, but just to not like lean on this fully and think that is a glorious life because you must be looking at too much social media because the things that people are portraying on social media like I mean unless you're Chris Bumstead okay <laughs> um, then you know the rest is kind of a fairy tale man like you, you gotta like you gotta have a job you should go to school, get your education, and treat this as a hobby that you really love. I also think as well, if you treat something like a job, if something becomes a job, you start to dislike it. Oh, for sure. Because like, not I found that, but I have found that at times where it's like, oh, I have to like, like, I still do it, right? It's not like I don't do it, but sometimes I can't be asked to be like, you do it anyway, right? Yeah. It's like, and that's, the whole thing about like discipline is like turning up when you don't feel like doing it and you just do it and get on with it. Yeah. But when something becomes like there's pressure on you to actually make money from doing that thing, it's probably going to become less fun and you're probably going to enjoy it less. Of course. I mean, remember bodybuilding is, there's an expiration, right? Like there's always a new younger guy that's coming up or a new younger girl is coming up and you just have to know, you know, you have to be mindful and of where, where you're at in the market at the time, you know? Um, yeah. You just, we do things because of discipline, right? We did it, like, no matter what. But that applies to other things in life, too, if you want to be successful. You know, sometimes, you know, you I have to do a bunch of check-ins and it's late at night, but guess what? Those people are paying me their hard-earned money to get a response. And I, I just do it. And I, and I do it with a lot of focus because that's my job, right? But with bodybuilding, I feel like if you're just saying that I need to, because your placings are never like guaranteed. When right? you can't control that. You can't, you can't control, control your turns up. No, and you never know who's gonna show up. Um, or maybe, you know, you may not have gotten enough sleep the night before, or you have some nerves and you're, you're, you start holding a little bit of water. Things didn't go your way. You know, this happens all the time. So unless you're making like crazy amounts of money and then you have to just focus on bodybuilding, like someone like a C -bomb. I'm, I'm but he's doing other business things on his portfolio that people may not see, but he, he does have other things going on, you know, and I think sometimes the, the new generation, um, and I hope that guys like that are on the top can come out and say this, you know, in their interviews or in their YouTube videos and encourage guys and, and younger, younger women that are coming into the business or the sport to really focus on not just bodybuilding their craft, but like, you know, other things in life like education and having a career well that's why I think one of the most important things and something I've always thought is like not being a one trick pony like right. not just being really good at this one thing right because I think there's so many people that are like so one dimensional yes and I think the best people in life or like look at the most fascinating people look at someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. right uh, won the Olympia multiple times um, huge Hollywood hoop moves off came governor of California right? governor of California so like multifaceted yeah. life and yeah. achieved a lot whereas like if you just do one thing it's gonna probably not give you the fulfillment you want right right also when it has a short short window right short window yeah so again I, like bodybuilding has been the best thing that ever happened to me in my life i love bodybuilding i still consider myself a bodybuilder when people ask me um about men's physique in my mind i'm a bodybuilder you know, I, I i train to build my body and I, I love the sport so much that i i just feel like it's up to us to to educate people and let them know 
that there's other things in life. You know, don't be so hard and don't don't live and die by a show. You know, I have some people that get so upset with they're placing at a show, and I'm like, I have to ask them questions after. Like, is this the best you ever looked? Yes. When? How was your prep compared to last prep? Did you learn a lot of things? Did you see your body transform in different ways? Yep. Check. When? So it's just shifting your mind in in a, in a, in a more optim, optimistic setting, you know? I distinctly remind, remember you saying that yes to me, and it had a very profound effect on me. And the other thing you said to me as well was that don't come back and compete until it's a point where you're like, fuck me, that's a big difference. That's right. Like, shocking. Yeah. And I know you you were talking about competing again. I love your physique. And I feel like now you've improved so much from when I saw you on stage, right? Because you keep in condition. You have a lot of good size now. Um, I don't know what your starting point was before your last contest. But even myself was, you know, entertaining the point, uh, the fact, the, the idea of coming and competing at the, um, the Masters Olympia. That's going to happen in, I believe, four weeks. And because of how my life is now, you know, there's a lot of people that depend on me. I have to put food on the table and I'm committed to so many other things right now that are very important that I was not able. And people might say, oh, it's an excuse. No, it's not an excuse. It's just I have other priorities that you can't commit as much as you want to. Right. I can't commit as much as I want to. And to do this, my point is to your standard, right? Yeah. To do this to my standard, I haven't competed since 2017. If I came back on stage, I need people to be like, what the fuck? We're, like, we've never even seen him better than this, right? And that's what I told you yesterday. The next time you go on stage, you want to be so much better than you ever were, you know? So even if you place dead last, you know you got the job done. You know you ticked off all the boxes. You know you did what you had to do. But you were you're the most superior Charlie that you've ever been, you know? And that's how I feel like if I ever step on stage again, Wherever I place, I just have to be so impressed with myself and to, sh and to give back to the people who have been supporting me and following me and loving me all these years, the best me, you know? Here's a really weird mindset. I, I remember happening the last show, I think it happens every time. It's like, I made it and I endured it through. Did you ever feel like that? Because for me, it's almost like, always oh, it's like a, a war of attrition of like, how much can I endure of like how shit this is? Because people like unless you've been through the process, like yeah. it fucking sucks towards the end. Yeah. Um. For, for probably ninety five percent of people, did you ever have that mindset even when you were at the top of your? I remember those thoughts crossing my mind, but leaving very fast because, listen, man, my childhood was. My parents are tr amazing people. I love them dearly. They did their best. They gave me the things that I needed. The essential things and and um, a little was a lot for me and my brother so we, we worked with the tools that we were given right so when I hear people talking about or feeling like this or feeling sorry for themselves I've been through too much shit in my life you know that people would consider negative I consider uh, or not, not just negative but like you know not as I've seen a lot of things that I didn't want to see growing up, you know what I mean? And I experienced a lot of things that I didn't want to experience growing up. Um, but I don't ever use those as an excuse. I'm, I'm happy that I was able to go through those things and overcome them that in a prep when I was feeling a little bit of strain or tension or weakness or pain or suffering, like people would say, it's a walk in the park, man. It was easy. I remember... You know, you have like defining moments you always remember. I remember being, feeling very sorry for myself doing cardio at like 6 a.m. I think it was like 2018 in like, in the UK, it's like a, called a pure gym. It's like a shitty 24 hour gym uh, in a place called Epsom. And I remember going on the cross train and feeling very sorry for myself. Oh, this is so hard. Woe is me. And I looked over and there's this woman who's obviously going through cancer treatment working out. And I was like, fuck. There you I was go. like, I was 27, 28 at the time. I was like, and this is my own conscious choice. Yeah. You're a super fit 28 year old and you're yeah. like bitching and moaning in your head about like, this is hard. It's like, this woman's fucking trying to survive. I was like, fuck. She's trying to live. Yeah. You know like, what I mean? So things like that, and this is, this is why I really like you because um, things like that mean something to you, hmm. right? You pay attention to these type of things. And I feel like the, the new generation today doesn't, right? They're so into themselves and, and um, 
I'm not saying this in a pessimistic way or anything like that. I'm just, it's what my observation is. They're not, they're not thinking about people who are just trying to survive. You know what I mean? Like I have some clients, man, that are like, they're broke. They're taking their money to pay for this. They don't fucking complain. They don't ask me to substitute anything. They get the job done and they come superb. And I think to myself, here are some people that have so much, but all they want to do is complain and they're so unhappy. And here's this guy or this girl that have so little, but they're so outstanding. You know what I mean? So it's, it's things like that just kind of make you. It's a paradigm shift. And I think that's also one of the things I think I love about traveling is because it gives you a lot of different perspectives of things sure. in the world because yeah. Now, for example, me living in Dubai, you end up with a very warped perception of the world. I remember saying to this US about yeah. supercars, like yeah. supercars really don't really interest me anymore yeah. because you just see them like you see it all the time. every other car, that's yeah. cool, whatever, that's yeah. another Lamborghini, that's nice. Yeah. Um, and we love cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know I like cars, yeah. like, I love cars, but yeah. like, I'm just less bothered now because yeah. you see them all the time. Yeah. And that's the perception thing because that's the world you're in. And sure. then when you start to travel to other areas and you see maybe people who are less fortunate or like homeless situations even like driving through LA there's a lot of homeless people and yeah. stuff like that yeah. again it reminds you of like how fortunate you, you are, are. Mm. yeah and it's like you know sometimes I get a little bit um, I don't want people to have the impression of me I really don't care what people think about me but I don't want people to have the impression of me that I'm superficial um, I love fashion you know I wear silk clothes man you know, silk Versace clothes, and it's something that I loved when I was a kid. You know what I mean? Like looking at the rock and silk Versace shirts, and um, I'm eccentric with my jewelry and these type of things. It's because I didn't have it before, and now I can, I can have it because I earned it, right? And my my goal is to show people that just because at some point in your life you don't have something doesn't mean you can't have it one day if you're not focused and work hard, right? And dream about it. Be a dreamer. Allow yourself to dream. Right. And, you know, I moved to the United States in Las Vegas with one suitcase and a dream. I tell this story often because people don't people saw that I became friends with Jay and that I was like a star immediately. How did that come about with Jay? Yeah. Um, so I moved to Vegas in 2010 and I got rid of all my stuff back home in Toronto. People thought I was crazy. You're gonna to go to Vegas to pursue bodybuilding? You're 30 years old, are you out of your mind? Like, you can't win a, a show here in, in, in Toronto, but you're gonna to go to Vegas and make it? I say, yeah, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna try my, I really don't like using the word try, but I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna make shit happen, okay? And I've always been good with networking and um, I just love p talking to people and, and like you said, you know, traveling allows you to really see how people live their life and different types of cultures and you see different colors and you taste different things and, you know, so the essence of different people and, and their cultures and communities. And uh, I moved here with one suitcase and a dream and people thought I was crazy. Um, my dream was just to have the chance to, be, to try to become a professional, to turn an IFBB pro. And I wanted to step out of the box and I went to, I, I was traveling here like I told you I became friends with um, my one of my dearest friends Greg McCoy who lives in in Dallas Texas and Steve Kuklo and I would travel to Texas and I would train with them and at the time Steve had like a lot of hype around him to win to turn pro he was an amateur at the time and it was such a big hype online and in the magazines and stuff like who's gonna be Mr. USA and um, so I started becoming more aware of how large bodybuilding was in the US and I said to myself I need to be here right because I'm making friends with all these people that I see in the magazines George Ferris is my coach now I just feel so like I fit I fit this this place I need to be here so when I decided I was going to move to Vegas I had friends that lived in Vegas so I was just visiting often and um, Jay would come to Canada often because he was sponsored by Muscle Tech and Muscle Tech was a Canadian company, is a Canadian company. And we had a lot of mutual friends from Canada that he was already friends with. So we had a circle of friends that, that you know, people were saying, hey, you, you, you guys should meet, what, what not. And this is 2009 uh, when I actually saw him win 
second row when he came back and won his title in 2009 it was like the most epic thing I've ever seen in my own eyes um, so a friend of ours named Koi he worked for um, Muscle Tech and he was like the athlete's liaison and uh, he was very good friends with Jay and he connected us so one day I get a text message from Jay and I was like holy fuck Jay Cutler just text messages me you know what I mean and he's like hey you know uh, Koi wanted us to connect and you know you're friends with this guy and that guy and I'm friends with him too and we just started bullshitting you know and then our friendship just built on like I said just on real stuff it was nothing to do with bodybuilding but he was like you know you're here in Vegas so anything you need you know and uh, I took a page out of his book because I feel like today when, when people come to Vegas I want to offer the same sort of you know welcoming so that's how we became friends and then that was it man we were just connected from that day you know I talked to him every day we text all day, every day for, he just had a 50th birthday party, a uh, birthday, sorry, not a party. But um, I said to him, I said, you remember when I threw your 40th surprise birthday party 10 years ago at a restaurant that we, one of our friends, Tarek Ali owns called Marrakesh. I did his surprise 40th birthday party 10 years ago. So um, he's probably one of the most uh, incredible human beings I know. One of the things you mentioned then was bodybuilding being huge in the US do you think bodybuilding will always be mainly located in the US or do you see it maybe spreading more globally it has has really spread globally you know it's huge in the Middle East now huge in the Middle East huge in Brazil South America incredible talent coming from there um, even Canada you know, to be fair yeah you know my wife Jennifer Dory won the Olympia in 2021 Chris Bumstead is what four time Mr. Olympia or five Canadian. time Canadian um, a lot of great Canadians coming coming into the uh, bodybuilding world and being great champions but I feel that you need to be here in the US you see even when I spoke with uh, Miss Charlie I said I think you can be great at this you need to be here you need to be seen here you know all the judges are here all the big shows are here all the sponsors are here, right? So, um, for me and Jennifer to make the move from our family to Canada, from Canada here, I mean, Jennifer's career has taken off all the way to the top because she's present and she's able she's able to engage with her followers and her fans. Uh, she's able to be present at certain shows, and we love to do this. So this is like. A dream for us mm. to be at these things you know well you basically your job is going to do what you love to do right we love to do it so that's our job and you know may, it may seem like a drag to others and we always encourage other people like you know get dressed up you know go to a show and you know meet people shake hands you know represent for your division right and we love doing it so i feel like the more you're able to be seen here because it's one thing to be amazing on stage and what I what I always did when I was an amateur is that people of course I look different I'm I'm biracial I had braids in my hair right like I look like you bring the braids back if I could grow hair I could <laughs> bring it back but I'm losing my hair now the older I get so I'm gonna keep it tapered for now but um, I look different you know and I was like well I didn't look at it like the odds were against me like a light-skinned guy but it's good to stand braids, out right right it, it made me stand out I won the Olympia it's crazy right so, and that's another thing I would always encourage all races to, to compete and, and, and be part of this fitness game. But being here and being present, you, you're able, it's one thing to like see someone on stage and be like, wow, he has an amazing physique. But it's another thing to engage with someone and they feel the energy, right? And experience with you, right? And that was very important to me. I always wanted people you know, to, to have a, a reputation, to build a reputation and earn respect takes, takes a long time and you can ruin it like this, right? So it was important to me not to just be known as the guy with the braids and a nice physique. I always wanted people to, 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 to know me and to know that I had manners and I was polite and I was very, you know, there's a lot of gratitude. And I would always go shake the judging panel's hands after because I didn't know anyone, I would say, Hi, my name is Mark Anthony, and I was 
it was an honor to be in front of you today. And I walk away. And today, I've become friends with those judges, and they're like, man, it was so weird and so trippy, but I always remembered you because you were so polite, you know? And it was like, not only because you had a good physique, but I remembered you because you were so kind. And that's one thing my father always taught me, was just to always be kind to people, you know? And sometimes I feel like I walk into a room like I own the room, and people will see me and be like, oh, that guy's cocky, you know what I mean? But, you know, sometimes cocky and confidence, they look alike, you know? But... And I have a lot of people tell me like, man, you're such a nice guy. You're, you're so helpful. And that's who I am. But um, I always wanted people to, 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 to engage with me so they knew that I was a nice guy and I was polite and I had manners. It was important to me. For me, that's the most important thing from anyone. And I think it's why we get on so long. And the amount of times I've referred to you almost protecting other people that we know mutually in terms of like they're my friend yeah. is a really nice endearing thing to hear because I don't think you see many people doing that now right? in particular in the fitness industry yeah. Um, and like the way you want to be treated is the way you treat other people right because so it comes back yes. which I think is something people really miss now yes I, it, it's just you know people call it old school I'm loyal to a fault if you're my friend I'll lay down in traffic for you you know what I mean um, and like you said, I feel like that's missing today. I feel like a lot of people are just so into themselves and they're not um, conscious of people around them. You know, I even see that with sometimes like spouses that I'll be coaching someone and the spouse is just so catering to the person that's competing and the person that's competing is just not grateful at all. You know what I mean? The way they I sometimes have to take them aside and be like, hey, listen, like this person has your back. This person wants you to win. This person is doing everything to make you happy. So have a little bit of kindness and respect for and treat them. That's someone that's, that's your, par your partner. Um, what, I've, what I've observed now is just like people are just like, they just wanna run over everyone. They don't care, you know? So when I speak about my friends that you've probably observed or people that I, I, I admire or respect, you know, it's not that I'm trying to protect them, it's just that I want- What's best for them. Yeah, always. I want, I want what's best for, I want people to be happy. You know, if I can, if I can add this much happiness to your experience with me, then I feel accomplished. What would you say is the biggest thing anyone can take away from you that would help them in terms of? I think the biggest thing people miss is the ability to maybe commit and execute and see things through. What would you say from your career is the biggest thing that's helped you do that? Oh man, that's, that's pretty dynamic. I mean, I feel like what I want people to take away from their experience with me is that I made them feel good. I made them feel good. And it's, it's not that I'm blowing smoke in anyone's ass. It's that I want people to know that I acknowledge like even how they make me feel, you know, like, man, he made me feel like, you know, really good today because he acknowledged how kind I was or how much I helped him. You know, I want people to know that I'm grateful. And um, I want people to remember me for being like a humble and to see my humility. Last question. What would be the best piece of advice you'd give me? You? Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, you're, you're a pretty dynamic person, man. Like, um, I don't know you for a long time, yeah. but I... I pay attention to to who you are, what you what you represent. I would like to have spent more time with you, but of course we're both busy. Um, I think you have a lot of. I think you have everything covered. I think you're. I think you're one of those people that are just good at everything. What I love about you is that you don't. I love a lot of things about you because I said that a few times today. I love that you never talk bad about anybody. I respect that about people, because. Every time we've talked about someone, you've always had something good to say, right? And nothing bad to say, which I love. Um, so my advice is to keep being you and keep making people like me feel great. And every time I leave you, I always feel like I've learned something to make myself better. So keep rising and always keep being yourself and move to the US. The US thing I'm working on, but yeah, I don't want to pay taxes. So I'm, yeah. you know, I'm trying to logistically work that out. But yeah. if anyone has any tips, drop me a message. Yeah. Um, really appreciate your time today, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, 
For everyone, I'll drop Mark's details below the podcast so you can check him out on Instagram. Is there anywhere else you want to find out more about you? I'm mostly on Instagram. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, what's your Instagram handle for anyone listening? It's Mr. O. Mark Anthony. Okay, easy. So, if you guys love the podcast, make sure you smash the like button if you're dropping it, watching this on YouTube, subscribe, drop a comment on any questions, and make sure you share this episode with a friend. And we'll see you in the next episode soon.